In our look back at molecular orbital theory, we saw that in a diatomic molecule, atomic orbitals overlap to form molecular orbitals that are higher and lower in energy than the constituent atomic orbitals. So for example, in hydrogen, we start with 1s atomic orbital ingredients and we end up with molecular orbitals that are higher and lower in energy than the constituent atomic orbitals. So there's a splitting that goes on from the atomic to the molecular orbitals. And since we're looking at valence atomic orbitals, typically we end up with electrons within the bonding orbital while the antibonding orbital is empty. This is for a diatomic such as H2. When we get to talking about metals and solid state materials, the situation gets a little more complicated because the structure is now different. Rather than dealing with an interaction between two atoms and that's it, we're looking at a solid in which all of the particles are arranged in a crystal lattice and they all, to some degree, interact with one another. This means we might have something like a mole, 10 to the 23rd atomic orbitals on one side of the orbital energy diagram and another mole of atomic orbitals on the other side of the orbital energy diagram. And there's the question of how to arrange the molecular orbitals based on this huge collection of atomic orbital inputs. What happens here is that the atomic orbitals continually split each other. So there's a splitting to two, those two are split to four, those four are split to eight, those eight are split to 16. And as that continued splitting happens, the levels get denser and denser. So the molecular orbital energies get closer and closer and closer to one another. So what we end up with for the collection of molecular orbitals is a band of extremely tightly spaced orbitals with perhaps a very small gap between the bonding and anti-bonding levels. Above the energy of the input atomic orbitals, we have a band of molecular orbitals where the electrons are mobile. Electrons that have been excited into these levels, which are empty in the ground state situation, but can be occupied under regular thermal conditions. In other words, the gap between the lower and the upper energy levels is extremely tiny if it exists at all. Electrons in these higher energy levels can participate in electrical conduction and move throughout the metal. That's why we typically look at this block of molecular orbitals as what's called the conduction band. The word conduction tells us that electrons in these levels are able to move throughout the metal and conduct electricity. The word band tells us that this is a very tightly spaced collection of molecular orbitals. In other words, a band of molecular orbitals. It's not continuous, but it's extremely, extremely close to continuous in that the levels are very, very dense energetically. For the most part, the conduction band is unoccupied, and that should strike an analogy with the antibonding orbitals in small molecule molecular orbital diagrams. Those are for the most part unoccupied, particularly the valence antibonding orbitals. On the other hand, the band of orbitals below the atomic orbital energies is typically fully occupied with electrons from the metal atoms. Specifically, these are occupied by the valence electrons of the metal atoms, and thus this is called the valence band. Electrons in the valence band are not conducting because the valence atomic orbitals are generally localized on the atoms within the structure. So an electron has to be excited from the valence band to the conduction band to actually move through the material. And for metals, for which this gap in energy between the valence and conduction band is very tiny, this is an extremely easy excitation that happens readily at room temperature. In materials that are less electrically conducting or not conducting at all, we also can take this band theory approach, recognizing that the atoms are in a crystal lattice, so they're going to interact with each other. But what we'll see in these cases is a gap between the valence band and conduction band. So let's start by looking at a metal, first of all. We had, in a metal, the valence and conduction band are essentially right next to each other. There's very little gap between these two bands, with the valence band filled and generally non-conducting electrons. The conduction band is empty, except for a few electrons that have been thermally excited that participate in electrical conduction. This is the situation for metal. In an insulator, there's a large separation between the valence and conduction bands. The conduction band is very high in energy, and the valence band is very low in energy, and there's a very large gap between 
the valence and conduction bands. This is the situation for an insulator, and the reason a compound characterized by this band structure is an insulator is because this excitation from the valence band to the conduction band requires too much energy. That kind of excitation doesn't occur at room temperature, and so the material acts like an insulator. A good example of this would be something like diamond, which is composed of a network of covalent bonds. Those covalent bonds can be thought of as having a band structure, but all of those sigma bonding orbitals and sigma star antibonding orbitals are separated by a huge energetic spacing, and so the compound is an insulator overall. This distance between the valence band and the conduction band is known as the band gap, or sometimes the band gap energy. And the size of the band gap has a huge impact over the behavior of the material, as we just saw. If the band gap energy is too large, preventing an excitation at normal temperatures, then the material will act as an insulator at those temperatures. Between metals and insulators, we have this fascinating group of compounds that are characterized by a small band gap. The band gap is large enough to prevent conduction at room temperatures, but can be narrowed through the introduction of an electric field, as we'll see shortly. So we can see for this class of compounds, the band gap energy is intermediate between that of an insulator and that of a metal. And so it's not an insulator, but it's not exactly a conductor. So it's what we call a semiconductor. In a semiconductor, the conduction band is actually partially occupied when the substance is conducting. And we can show that by drawing a little red sliver here to indicate that there are some electrons in the conduction band. And while it's not nearly as many as we would find, for example, in a metal conductor, under the right circumstances, we can promote the excitation of electrons from the valence band to the conduction band. Before getting there, let's calibrate ourselves with a few examples of band gap energies. So carbon, which we already saw as an insulator, for example, in diamond, has a band gap energy of about 520 kilojoules per mole. Silicon is much, much lower at 107 kilojoules per mole. Germanium, even lower still, and these two are great examples of semiconductors. One form of tin, known as gray tin, has an even smaller band gap energy of 8 kilojoules per mole, and lead, which is squarely in the metal category, has a band gap energy of zero kilojoules per mole. This is essentially a very good metallic conductor. So these three substances with finite band gap energy are semiconductors. We can cause the materials to conduct under the right circumstances, but there is a barrier to conduction in the form of the band gap energy. There are two types of semiconductors that we're going to be concerned with. The first is what's called an intrinsic semiconductor. And in an intrinsic semiconductor, the valence and conduction band are close enough in energy that excitation happens naturally to a degree, owing to the fact that the gap in energy between the two bands is relatively small. So we get spontaneously and naturally some occupation of the conduction band and some empty levels near the top of the valence band, and it's these electrons that exist right here at the top of the conduction band that cause electrical conductivity. Something like gray 10 with a band gap as low as 8 kilojoules per mole can behave as an intrinsic semiconductor. However, many semiconductors, including most of those that we find in everyday life, which are composed of silicon, have larger band gap energies and need some additional assistance, if you will, in promoting electrons to the conduction band because of the relatively large band gap here. In an extrinsic semiconductor, we take a substance that could behave as a semiconductor with a relatively large band gap, such as a block of silicon, and we include in it another species called a dopant spread randomly throughout the solid. So for example, we might dope silicon with phosphorus by introducing phosphorus atoms into the silicon crystal structure. Silicon is a group 14 element. We often dope group 14 semiconductors with either group 15 elements like phosphorus or group 13 elements such as boron. These two types of dopants, group 15 and group 13, give rise to two different types of semiconductors. If we think about the number of valence electrons in a phosphorus atom, phosphorus has five valence electrons. So if we imagine, for example, a series of silicon atoms bonded together, silicon has four valence electrons and can form four bonds to surrounding atoms. But if we replace one of those silicons with a phosphorus atom, 
that leaves us with an extra electron. If I replace this silicon with a phosphorus, I have the four bonds and then this single electron left hanging around. And in fact, this electron is mobile. It can leave the phosphorus with a positive charge and travel throughout the material as part of the conduction band. Each phosphorus atom brings with it these extra electrons which end up filling the conduction band. That leaves us in a situation where the valence band of the semiconductor is completely filled as usual. But the conduction band as well includes a significant block of electrons brought in by the dopant that are conductive. So in a sense this p-doped material includes an excess of electrons. Because electrons are negatively charged, this is called an n-doped material. It's been doped with an excess of negative charge in the form of these electrons that fill the conduction band. If we think about doping with boron, in essence we end up with the opposite situation where electrons have to be pulled out of the silicon lattice in order to satisfy the octet at boron. So boron ordinarily only brings three valence electrons in. If silicon is to form a bond to this boron, that's going to leave a negative charge on the boron atom, right, since it now has formerly four valence electrons rather than three. And that's going to leave a positive charge somewhere else in the material. It's a little bit more difficult to think about this positive charge because it doesn't correspond to a particle per se in the way an electron carries with it a negative charge. You can think of that positive charge as being associated with the protons in the silicon atoms in the structure. Every boron atom we introduce takes one electron away from the silicon lattice, leaving one of the silicon atoms positive. So on this schematic we have here, each boron brings with it a positive charge, or what's called a hole. In the resulting band picture, we're left with a conduction band that is completely empty, and because the borons have sort of siphoned off some of the electrons from the valence band, we end up with some empty levels within the valence band as well. And this is remarkable because this means that, for example, electrons in the valence band of a normal piece of silicon can now fill in these levels. Since those empty levels are associated with positive charge and a lack of electrons, within the material. This is called a p-type doped semiconductor. We can combine extrinsic semiconductors like this in solid-state electronic devices to obtain elements that are controlled by an external current or voltage. And this is basically the essence of the modern electronics revolution. Examples of materials that depend on doped semiconductors include diodes, which convert alternating current to direct current and prevent the backflow of electrical current, light emitting diodes which have the exact same function but emit light in the process of conducting current, diode lasers, and transistors which control or amplify electrical signals in response to a separate electrical current or voltage. We won't discuss these in more detail but there's a section of your text that covers these applications really nicely.